Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. I think I'll declare as Corit. So welcome to the, uh, the August lab tutorial. Um, I'm Nick Benton, for those of you who don't know me, and I'm the new czar for the lab tutorials. So um, after, after today's talk, you will all be inspired to come up with um, talks that you would like to give in this slot. And when that happens, do come to me um, and, uh, and, and discuss the talk that you'd like to give, because um, it would be great to have more internal talks and keep the um, frequency up. So um, I'm extremely pleased that today we have Andrew Fitzgibbon, um, who's going to give us a talk on learning about shape. Uh, and as he's a local boy, I get away without having to do any great introduction. But for those of you who don't know Andrew, he's principal researcher in computer vision and winner of numerous prizes, which it would only embarrass him if I were to list. So um, I'm just going to hand over to Andrew. Thank you very much. Um, so I would like to talk a bit about some tools that we use in computer vision and uh, particular tools we use for describing the shapes of 3D objects. Uh, so I'm also trying to, going to try and teach you a little bit of maths, but a very little bit. Um, and I hope I'll give you a picture of, you know, um, uh, what, our, what the day-to-day -day life uh, of, our, uh, of our researchers is. Um, there is some maths in it, but it's not very complicated. Uh, the work I'm going to talk about, I'm going to show examples of work, and I'm going to talk about work that I did with lots and lots and lots of different people. But there are a few people in particular um, I would like to sort of call out who, who really helped me along uh, this path. Uh, Mukta was my PhD student um, at Oxford, um, with whom I continue to collaborate at Microsoft. Uh, Tom Cashman was an intern who introduced me to one of the key tools called subdivision surfaces. He's here somewhere. Um, uh, Richard Stebbing was another intern. Um, and uh, John Taylor is a former intern, now a researcher. And all of these people have helped me in some way to understand uh, this space. Uh, so uh, what does a uh, computer graphics, computer vision, computer scientist mean by shape? Well, one thing I might mean by shape is the stuff that's underlying, the stuff that's going on uh, underneath this computer graphic simulation. And as I move a slider uh, around, maybe I can visit the, uh, the 3D meshes, that uh, a sequence of 3D meshes that describe the shape of the human face. And this was work done, as you can see, uh, a long time ago, um, uh, 16 years ago, which first introduced us to the idea maybe that we could have um, spaces of 3D shapes that we would, we, we would, we would learn from data. Uh, more recently, um, people have been able to build spaces of 3D body shapes. So by taking hundreds of 3D scans, so they get, uh, get a person or several people uh, each to stand in front of several Kinect sensors. Kinect sensors didn't exist at the time, but the principles existed. So by getting hundreds of people to stand in front of multiple scanners, they could, uh, again, build uh, a tool that would allow them to visit the 3D shapes, a variety of 3D shapes and different body shapes and different poses. Not directly related, but using some of the, uh, the same tools, is work we did just last year where um, we took uh, input from uh, a Kinect, um, if we ran that input through Kinect Fusion, even though this person is only moving, uh, is not moving very non-rigidly, if we ran it through Kinect Fusion, we would get uh, a big mess. Um, but by using, again, some of the tools I'm going to talk about, uh, we're able to build a rigid model of the person, despite the fact that the person is moving non-rigidly in the input sequence. And again, using the, using the sort of ideas that I'm going to talk about. Um, before that, um, uh, again, using some of these ideas, I don't know how many of you have seen this, but I think uh, I rarely get tired of it. Um, we did some work where by using the Connect body scanner to track the, uh, the person, the person could uh, lock themselves onto um, a big uh, soup of polygons, which here the soup of polygons looks like a chair, um, and then you know, create amusing animations uh, of the chair. Um, uh, you can also apply it to any mesh, uh, so the more literary-minded above you 
uh, among you might be more amused by a walking bookshelf. Um, and if that doesn't work, uh, you can get your friend to do the back part, um, and the two of you can work together uh, to, to animate a horse. Um, so that's a good thing. And then um, work that we're doing at the moment, um, or, or what we've been doing recently, but it's sort of a current area is, um, can we model video? So can I take a 2D, flat 2D video with just sort of um, uh, color pixels, no connect cameras anywhere nearby, and can I turn that into uh, a 3D video uh, by taking, downloading a model of an Impala off the internet, sort of mapping it onto the 3D video and learning the, learning the motion? Uh, look, we can. Um, and then, uh, practically, this is a diagram from another paper from this year, uh, can we uh, determine the space in which hands live? Can we learn the space in which hands live so that when we get an individual hand, um, we can pick it out and track it, and then when we can track it, we'll be able to make cool user interfaces uh, like this one where the tracked hand picks up 3D objects, uh, manipulates them, and you know, paints stuff, and so on. So that would be... That would be great if we could do that. And one of the tools, uh, oh, I didn't check my mail. Sorry, Danny. Uh, uh, um, yeah, we'll, we'll be able to do that when we have a better model of shape. <clears throat> All of the shape models I've described so far have been constructed. Our hand model has, um, I, remind me of the numbers, but you know, 50 people with sort of a few seconds of connect video each. Uh, the human body model uh, is hundreds of 3D scans very painstakingly meshed together and the face model something similar. Um, so I'm going to present, the last thing I'm going to present is the hardest problem and yet it's the one uh, Tom Cashman and I started on, which is what if I had nothing? What if I wanted to build one of these shape models, these shape spaces? Uh, how would I do it? And our, our idea was that we could just type the name of any set of objects, of any category of objects that we thought of into a search engine the search engine would give us back some pictures of that category. And you know, we would look at the pictures, and if it gave me loads of Miami Dolphins, then I'd decide, was that the thing I wanted, and edited them out. So somehow, I define what I want simply by picking the pictures that mean the thing I mean. So these pictures meant the thing I meant when I typed in Dolphins. Um, and what we would like to do is then um, uh, recover from that uh, set of pictures uh, the same thing as we saw before, a sort of a set of sliders that would describe the shape that was represented in there. So this is a much, much harder problem because instead of 200 dense 3D scans, we've got 32 flat 2D images. But um, by using the kind of tools uh, that, we, that we now know about, we were able to, so we couldn't solve it from nothing, but we were able to take a standard dolphin and, and um, learn the ways in which you could change the shape of a standard dolphin that you downloaded from the internet to match, to match the set of input images. Um, so that's, in some sense, a long-term goal would be to do this from, from absolutely nothing. Uh, but at the moment, the tools we learned there really helped us with, um, with various other problems, and the hand tracking, is, uh, as we learned today, um, is going to work much, much better. Choose eight sliders. Ah, we told it eight. You told it. Yes. You didn't work that out. No. Okay. Um, my. What would have happened if you'd said one? Uh, one slider would probably have done scale. In fact, you'll get a little hint because later on we'll see the optimization in progress, mm -hmm. and it actually goes through increasing the number of sliders. Uh -huh. um, but my answer for all of these problems will be uh, there will be some other parameters as well, which are sort of how knobbly is each individual, and then how much variation is there among individuals. And my answer to all of those parameter setting questions will be, look at it and pick the ones you like better. Right? Because, or it'll be, go to your downstream application, whatever that is, and then pick the value. I won't try to use any statistical mumbo jumbo to produce k equals eight. How many sliders? Because you're not, not going to tell it what the sliders should do. No, you just say how many. Okay. So you try, tr try tree. Ah, try three. Um, that's tough for me. Uh, see if it works. If you don't like it, add another one. If you add too many, it'll all go crazy. So you go back to the one that was sort of unsatisfactory but not crazy. Um, yeah. Right, so that's fine. So if we know about shape, we can do lots of stuff. Um, let's see what I'm going to mean by shape and what, we, what, you know, what you should all think of as a, um, as a sort of a functional or a, a description of shape that we can use in a computer program. 
Uh, and essentially, I'm going to look at three types of, of representation of shape. They're all really the same. Um, but it's kind of a lift. Um, we're going from easy to more difficult. So and many of you will, will have a good idea of how to do this or, or know about this. So my first, the first type of shape I'm going to talk about is my thingy. Sorry. Uh, Working? Yes. So the first type of shape I'm going to talk about is uh, a, a function um, where we have an x-coordinate along here and a y-coordinate along here, and we have some equation. Y is a function of x, and that describes a certain type of shape that, that must live along, along the real number line. The second type of shape I'm going to talk about is, is curves. So a curve is a function which takes a real as input and outputs 2D points. Okay, so here's an example of a, a curve that takes real numbers, let's say, between 0 and 1, and outputs x values, y values, and plots like that. And then a surface is a function that takes u, uh, two real values, u and v, uh, outputs a 3D point, and this example here, cos, sine, and v, uh, returns a cylinder. Okay, so these are three sort of definitions, uh, functional definitions that will give us different types of shape. But I'm going to explore them uh, one at a time, really. And essentially, what I want to get at is how do I, so now you have a picture of what a shape might look like. It's a function in the computer. Uh, what I'm really going to have to do is take these shapes and fit them, fit them to some data. Uh, that's when the computer graphics becomes computer vision, essentially, when I get some data from the world and make the shapes match it. So uh, I'm going to give you a little quiz because uh, you love that sort of thing. Um, so I'm going to ask you, so I'm going to tell you we're in this domain of, of functions. So I want a formula um, which is of the form y equals something with x's in it, um, which uh, describes these shapes. Does anyone want to volunteer me a formula for the left shape? Simon. X. Good choice. Good choice. Yeah. Uh, do you want to volunteer me a formula for the middle shape? Did I hear an x squared? Yeah, I like an x squared. And does anyone want to volunteer me a formula for this shape? X minus x cubed, better than x cubed, x cubed, good generic one, x minus x cubed. Any others? Some people might say y equals, I don't know, like maybe it's a bit of a sine x. Oops, sorry plus, you know, 3x minus 2 or something. Could be a sine x <laughs> plus a line. <laughs> you don't think it is? All right. Anyway, you're all, ro anyway, you're all wrong. Because um, today, the formula for this shape is y equals if x less than, let's say, 0, return uh, x plus 1 squared, else return x minus 1 squared, and I'll have to add some constants. That's probably a minus one. That's probably a plus one. I haven't worked that out. I haven't checked even that they match at zero. Do they match at zero? No, they don't. Um, so <laughs> so let's, uh, let's not add, add any constants. Do they match at zero now? Yes, they do. Do the derivatives match at zero? Yes, they do. All good. OK, right. OK. <clears throat> and why is this a better, why am I claiming that, um, that this chap here on the right is a better description than x cubed, right? Which is because, as you know, um, there are polynomials that can model any function. So any function can be expressed as a linear combination of you know, increasing x cubed, x forwards, and x, x to the five. And the reason I'm saying this is better is that this is going to end up being much better behaved in lots of, way, in lots of ways. Uh, because I'm going to do a generalization of this, which is if x is less than 0, do that, else if x less than 1, do that, else, oops, sorry, terrible writing, else blah, 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 blah. And this is what I mean, what I meant in the abstract by a piecewise function. I'm going to define my function with ifs in it, branches in it, and it's going to make it look horrible if you're used to the kind of math mathematics which has closed form solutions. Andrew Blake. I don't think it's wrong yet. I don't think it matters, but I don't think the formula is yet correct. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, yes, it's terrible, isn't it? Because it's, um, it's, it's all terrible, yeah. Um, oh, thank you, thank you, yes, and the derivatives were right. What are your branching conditions? What are your branching conditions? Branching. Conditions. Ah, right, well, I didn't say that there were any yet. 
right? But what we should probably do, so let's, let's try and do this properly. Um, what we should probably do is make sure that at least the bit to the left of zero and the bit to the right of zero touch each other, right? That would be a good thing. And then we should also make sure probably that the derivatives are the same on both sides. Well, basically, you put a linear thing there. So could it be x squared less than zero? If x oh, I see. Sorry. That, yes, it could be. But um, that is where things get a bit complicated. And it's best to make that as simple as possible. Okay. And it doesn't hurt too much. In fact, you often don't even vary the zero. You could, you could make the zero parameter, or, but um, Why yeah. Why don't you do zero? Why don't you just have one at the left for each point? Ah. <laughs> very good, very good, right. So, um, because if I did that for every point, really the reason I'm doing this is because I want to be able to predict what's happening down here, let's say, yeah. or even in here, right? So I want to interpolate or extrapolate the point. So, yes, so I'm going to control the complexity of my model by limiting myself to a small number of segments. So if I have a thousand data points, I might say, mm, I can probably afford about 10 segments. Okay, and that's a way of controlling, you know, do I overfit or underfit? Um, with polynomials, I could do that by keeping the order of the polynomials small. But the, if I keep the order of the polynomials small, I, it's, it's just not as, as satisfactory a type of control, which I hope I will explain. You've got two numbers. You've got how many segments you have and the degree of the polynomials and you could vary both of those. You could indeed. So in the end, we will end up with about 500 segments and fourth order polynomials for dolphins. Um, will the spacing be fixed or? It will and it won't matter. It will in a funny way and it'll turn out not to matter. Yeah. Um, it, we won't have to do not point variation, but if we do, um, if, you know, you know, if you're asking because you know that there's a thing called variable not points, uh, we won't need to do it. Uh, but we could in the same way. Yeah. I'll move on even though this was just to give you a hint of what piecewise is, and then we'll... Um, <laughs> too much of a hint, obviously. Right, so I said uh, there were a couple of candidates for... Uh, so this is more generic form, um, where I've got these parameters under the curves, and I said it could be that, or it could be a thing with an if in it. Uh, this one definitely... Oh, this one still isn't right. Blimey. There we go. Uh, so that's right. Okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to take some shapes, and we're going to try and make the shapes meet some data. And when the shapes you know, are happy with the data, we'll have something useful. We'll have something we can use to extrapolate with. OK, so a shape is a function. It's a function from uh, here. I've written it as data type real to data type real. But in fact, it's very important that shapes are, are sort of a finite extent. All the shapes I drew were not, I didn't draw an infinite line, and I didn't draw an infinite parabola, and I didn't draw an infinite cylinder. So, in fact, all our shapes, all these functions are mapping from data types, which are subsets of the real. So, interval, I'm just going to let be a data type, which is real numbers between 0 and 1. And again, back to your question about, do I need, you know, is the, are these fixed data points? They are, and it's not going to matter. So, I, I, can, I can pretend every curve is a mapping from 0 to 1, just by scaling all the parameters for the bit I'm interested in, so they live in 0 to 1. So... A curve is a mapping from an interval to 2D. A surface is a mapping from interval to 3D. Thank you. Ah, yes, it should be. What I described was uh, an infinitely tall cylinder. Um, it's still good that I had the interval for you because I didn't visit the same points um, an infinite number of times. But yes, V should have been an interval. Thank you. I'll remember to fix that later. Right, so we looked at these functions, y equals a function of x, and I tried to argue that piecewise was better without really telling you very much why. Um, now I'm going to look at curves. And I'm going to look at curves for, oh, it's going to be at least 15 minutes. Um, uh, so I, I wrote a, f a curve. I said it was a function uh, mapping from a single number t. And what happens is maybe this corresponds to t equals 1. We could try and do stick in t equals 0 here. That'll be the point 2, 1. 2, 1. There we go. t equals 0. Okay? And I'm going to stick in. Uh, that worked fantastically well. So let's stick in t equals 1. That'll be 3, 1. That'll be that point. Do we agree? Right. Oh, no, you can't see these axes. Sorry, that's 2, 3, 0, 1. So as I move t equals 0, as I put in different values of t, my curve is going to move around here. 
If you like, you can do t equals a half and find out where it goes, but it seems a bit messy to me. So a curve is a for loop for t equals 0 to 1 at some step size. Um, uh, it draws out these points in R2. <coughs> of course, sticking, you know, calling it a function uh, is, not very, uh, is not very computer science 101-y. Um, so I'm going to make a curve, uh, a data structure, and it's going to be a data structure which has, um, which has this, um, uh, the abstract data structure curve is defined by only one thing uh, to begin with, which is a method called eval, which again takes a t and returns a point 2D. So the conic curve that we had there, so a specific type conic, which is a, uh, an instance of a, of a type curve, has the eval t function, which, um, writes, you know, which contains the function that I just, uh, just drew out as I moved across here. And of course, the reason I'm doing this to make, uh, to make a, a sort of subclasses of curve is that what I'm going to be dealing with all the time is a parameterized curve. And a parameterized curve has, uh, I intended to make this A, um, has a vector of numbers in it such that different settings of this set of parameters theta, so in this case it's six numbers, give me different instances of the curve class that I'm looking at. So the curve we looked at a minute ago was uh, t squared min uh, plus zero t's plus two, uh, t squared minus t plus one. Right? And that was a, an instance of this class conic that, that we were going to try and recover. They, they will be the sliders. In this case, they'll be not very good sliders. You'll, you'll change one of them a little bit, and the whole thing will go crazy. Um, but later, they'll be good sliders. But yes, thank you. These are the sliders. Theta, big theta are the sliders. So I told you curves had only one method on them, the eval, which takes a t and gives you the 2D point. But there are some other very important methods when you're, when you're going to introduce curves to data. And I'm going to talk a little bit about the implementation of those methods and the sort of implications um, that, it, that it gives for, for what we might want to do. Uh, so a very important method is to be able to take a point in the world. So here's my curve. So this blue thing represents the curve, uh, an instance of this class. And uh, given some other point in the world that isn't on the curve x, I would like a method which just tells me how far it is from x to the closest point on the 2D curve. <laughs> Equivalently, you might imagine supplying a function closest point, which takes a point in the world x, returns me a 2D point, which is this blue sort of blob here, which is the closest point on the curve. And you would implement that function for your curve. And you know, um, you, if you do it well, that might make other things easier. Clearly, one of these can be written in terms of the other. So the distance function could be uh, norm, meaning just 2D um, length of a 2D vector, length of the vector joining x to the closest point. So we, may, we am, may implement one or the other uh, when, we, when we do our work. <clears throat> we may also implement distance, not in terms of closest point, but by literally by, by writing down exactly our definition of distance. So what is the distance? Well, I have made an anonymous function here, lambda t, which for every value of t around the curve just reports me the distance between a val of t and the query point x. So this def definition of distance says, call a minimization function. And I'll, I'll do a little more details of what this looks like. So this is a generic function. Is this a higher order function? Yeah. It takes a function in, and yeah. Function. yeah, and it produces a number out. So it takes in this function, which measures distance from an arbitrary point t to the curve. It takes, typically, these things take an initial guess. That means the t value to start with, let's say on this curve, it happens to be here. Right? It doesn't really matter where it is. Um, so it takes this function in a t value to start with. And what this function will do is do some magic and figure out um, what the closest value is. Right? So everything up here is all the stuff I already said. It's getting smaller, but it's there so you can remember it. This was the function I wrote. f of t is vector difference between evaluate the function at t and the query point. Uh, the distance is going to be minimize f. I forgot to give it an initial estimate. And here is um, a very uh, dumb version of the minimize function. So the minimize function starts with an initial guess of t. That might be some point out here. So that's t, my initial guess. It computes the derivative of this function f of t. Now let me draw f of t. f of t is not the shape of the curve. f of t is something else. Okay. So there's t. 
and here's f. So let's pretend t equals 0 here. And as t increases, we move around the curve like this, eventually landing back here at t equals 1. So what's the distance going to do? Well, it's going to start. This is almost as high as it can be, right? So the distance is almost as high as it can be at t equals 0. So we'll start up here somewhere. And it kind of goes down, wee down to t is, let's say, a half. And then it goes up a bit. And actually, despite these concavities and so on, it's basically steadily climbing again until t equals 1. And then it goes down a bit for t equals 0. So I was given this uh, class curve. Where's my laser pointer? Actually, I'll try and use this thing. I hate these things. All right. OK, I can't see it. Um, I'll use this. Hmm? <laughs> OK, so I was given this uh, abstract class curve. I defined a new function f of t in terms of the function eval on curve. And this is what f of t looks like. And what my algorithm is going to do is start from an initial value, x, t equals 0, compute the gradient of the function, which luckily, as I change it, uh, tells me basically that this function is sloping down here in the, uh, to, towards positive x. I'm going to, so let's compute the gradient of the function. I'm going to, um, uh, sorry, the gradient tells me it's sloping up that way. I'm going to subtract a little multiple, we don't know what this is, let's call it 0.001, of the gradient, and I'm going to try again. Oops, overshot, back a bit. Maybe I should reduce alpha. Okay, this is a minimization function, a gradient descent function, which tries to find the closest point on the curve. So this is a terrible algorithm, but it's exactly the picture that you should have in mind for any algorithm which takes an anonymous function and slides downhill to get the minimum value. And what you should keep in mind that although this is a terrible algorithm, the good ones are really, really good. And when you try to run them, they will finish before you've even thought about getting a cup of coffee. And I'll, I'll show that in more complicated examples in a minute. OK. So what is my curve? Oh, but the crucial thing about this algorithm is this little dash here, because this little dash says compute derivatives. And derivatives of this function f will involve derivatives of this function eval, t. And so you are going to have to supply with your curve one more method, which is this method eval prime, which computes the derivative of the curve with respect to um, the parameter t. And again, I want to remind you that derivatives are not that scary. So the, one of the reasons we were always scared about these piecewise things is because, number one, there are no closed form solutions to anything. And number two, derivatives look scary. Well, it, it takes a while to realize the derivative of this messy function y, with ifs and things in it, is just if uh, the derivative of y with an if in it just passes through the if. So if you think about it, y is in two parts. Right? So y is some function in two parts. Let's pretend they don't even match. Okay, so this is y of t. And the derivative of y to the left of where they don't match is just the derivative of the thing to the left. The derivative of right is just the, thing, the derivative of the thing to the right. Obviously, the else branch at the moment includes the case t equals a, which is just some nasty undefined derivative thing. But all the curves we're going to use are going to make sure that this doesn't have a discontinuity. They're going to make sure that the derivative is OK, so it doesn't matter which side you go on. And that's the thing that suddenly makes it all easy. So piecewise looks crazy, because you naturally think, well, anything bad, anything could happen. The constructions we're going to use mean that it doesn't go crazy. And that makes everything super easy. So you described a kind of hill climbing algorithm, or at least the volume yes. value, yep. but which is vulnerable to you know, false minima and all those kind of things. Indeed it is. Indeed it is. And yet you'll see that um, we hit them all the time, but they're not like millions of them in typical problems that we look at. So often there are only you know, tens of these minima. So uh, it's... So to draw, um, if you look at the closest point problem that I've left on the top right there, there's really only one, there's a local maximum sort of the other way away. Um, if my query point had been here, there's x, then that's a local minimum. 
that's a local minimum, right? Pretty much anywhere I can draw a perpendicular. There's another, there's a local optimum sort of out here somewhere, right? So that's not a local minimum. As you move away from there, it does decrease. That's a, but it's, um, if you evaluated the gradient there, it wouldn't be very good. It would give you, it would give you a zero. You'd need a better algorithm. Um, uh, so yes, absolutely, there are local minimum in these algorithms. Um, and, and you'll see that empirically, we don't meet them as often as you might worry. And that even these guys, um, um, that, yeah, there are other reasons why they don't matter very much. But it is a crucial message. Yes, these things have local minima. Just because your function has two local minima does not mean you go off and do something else. So a thing people might do is say, well, blimey, it's got local minima. I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll call it a circle. Right? And I'll do everything with circles instead of the real shape. Well, that, that may be much wronger than. Are you simulating an elix? You could say that, but then you're wasting an awful lot of compute power. And you know, you're heating up the data center in a way that you might not be able to afford if you're trying to track a hand on a Surface Pro 3. Um, or you might not want to expend you know, if you're paying the energy bills. Um, so, yeah. so don't do that. Don't use simulated annealing. If you've got perfectly nice, smooth gradients just sitting there, right? Everything here is smooth. There are only two local minima. We'll sort it out later. Um, very important message. OK, um, so I'm going to talk about um, what we do with these functions when we want to meet some data. So here I have got uh, some from the world, some points. These might represent points on a connect scan, you know, sort of horizontal slice through some connect scan. And the red curve represents some shape that I want to use to describe those points in the connect scan. And the parameters theta, the, um, uh, what you call them, the sliders that control the shape, are the 2D positions of these uh, 12, 6 control points here. So, uh, so the unknowns in this problem are uh, 12 of these guys. Right? Those are the unknowns of my problem. And what would I like to do? Well, I'd like to adjust these 12 guys. I'd like to wiggle these chaps around until the red curve is as close as possible to each of the input data. And what I'm going to do is express this as yet another problem of minimization. Minimize, find me the 12 control points, such that when I call the curve constructor with those, uh, with those parameters, and then evaluate closest point, it is the small, oh, bother, sorry, distance. Right, so I want to minimize the distance from the adjusted 12 parameters to all the points. And I think you all agree that should do a better, that should be nice, right? That should be sort of a, a description of the data. We, in our group, have a brilliant trick for doing this, which I will outline to you. Um, I don't think we invented it, but it's a good trick. So the function, and this is a bit of, I'm going to, prove you a little theorem. It's only going to take about a minute, and you should all be able to follow it. Um, we, the problem I set up was minimize, call a minimize function. So argmin means minimize, find me the curve parameters theta and, and spit them back out the end, return the parameters that were the minimum. So find me the 12 parameters corresponding to the six control points, such that the sum over all the data examples, all the 2D points that I had, so these, uh, these x's here, to minimize the sum over all of those of closest point. So min over t, eval of t, et cetera. I'm doing it more generically because this is a trick you can use when you're not fitting to data. OK, so I want to find the parameters theta to minimize the sum of closest points, minimize distance. So here's the trick you can use. So just to think of this problem, typically you might have a million of these uh, points. Right? So there'd be a million terms in the sum. And you might have, um, let's say, a very easy problem. You might have 100 or 500 parameters in here. So we want to optimize 500 parameters, million terms in the sum. So let's do some manipulations. So the first manipulation is trivial to computer scientists. This variable t is bound in this expression. It's not visible outside this expression. Right? I can change t to tn, and nothing happened. t was like the variable in a for loop. 4t equals 0 to 1, check all the values, return the minimum value. So I've done nothing by renaming t to tn. So what I can do now is I can store them all in an array. 
And I can store them all in an array, and that means I can do a minimization over all the unknown t values at the same time. So, sum of minima, still sum of minima, no change there. Now, a min of sum, and there's a little um, mnemonic here that you can go through. I might come back to this slide if I can remember its number. This is slide, it doesn't tell me. So, I'm going to tell you that this is true for a minute, and then we'll go back to it if people really want to. And what's happened? I've taken a 500-dimensional problem with a million nasty terms in the sum, and I've turned it into a 1,500,000-dimensional problem. So basically, a 500-dimensional problem has been turned into a million-dimensional problem. And guess which one works much faster? The one on the bottom works much, much faster. All right, so that's a good trick, I think. So one on the left, uh, only 500 parameters, really slow. One on the right, a million parameters, really fast. That's your message. Um, OK, I'm going to show you this happening once, then I'll show you a picture of some dolphins, and then we can um, go home. Okay. <laughs> so I'm going to start again. So even if you missed everything, you can start again. Imagine it is 1801, and um, you are in Germany, and a guest, did Germany exist in 1801? Anyway, you're around there. Um, and a guest planet has arrived called Ceres, and some Italian astronomers have been recording the azimuth and elevation of this planet uh, for a few months. It is the talk of the courts um, across Europe, um, and they've been recording, using their reasonably noisy measurements, uh, the position of the planet, and then it goes behind the sun. It takes a little while for news to propagate in Europe at this time, so um, the planet's going to come out in, I don't know, two or three months' time. Um, everybody wants to know where to stick their telescopes in order to be the first to catch sight of the new planet. So your job is to take the measurements taken by the Italian astronomers and uh, somehow figure out, extrapolate those measurements and make a prediction. Should I stick my telescope here or should I stick my telescope here? And for the machine learning people, um, the way this competition works is that the queen is going to pay you uh, with a quadratic cost um, uh, dependent on your distance from the planet in some abstract parameter space that no one really cares about. Um, <laughs> actually, that's not what's going to happen. You're basically going to win if you're closest, and you're going to be nobody if you're not. Right? So you really want to be close. Um, so you are Herr Dr. Gauss. Um, so you set up your problem, and you think, I'm going to win this Kaggle competition of 18, 1801. Um, I have got my 2D samples. I used X's before, I'm using S's now. Um, I've got my 2D samples, SN, and I've got uh, you know, their XY values. They're not really their azimuth and elevation, and it's a bit complicated, but you know, essentially this is the problem. And better still, I know the mathematical model for what's supposed to happen. Right? I know this thing, this celestial object, is traveling on an ellipse. So I have a very simple job. Uh, figure out the parameters of the ellipse. This is the true ellipse, this gray value. Uh, intersect them with the circle of the sun, report your position, everyone trains their telescopes, fine. So it's going to be good. If you do it in the way I just described, minimize the sum of the closest points of the thing to the ellipse, uh, this green curve is what you'll get. Right? And I'm, going to, I'm going to tell you no one else is closer. This is a good curve to get. Okay? So if you do it the way I described, you know, um, this is what you'll get. If you look in the literature, you will find a celebrated algorithm from 1999, which has a closed form. It's called direct, but it's kind of like a closed form solution to this problem. But it's not to this problem. It's to a slightly adjacent problem, which admits a closed form solution. And this is the answer that will give you. Although you will have computed it very quickly, um, it'll give you this very bad answer. OK, so let's look what we're, where we are. So what do we have? We have samples, I said, SNs, 2D points. N of them, let's say a million. I don't know when they were captured, what times they were captured. It's not that the clocks weren't very good. I mean, the clocks probably weren't very good. But um, when I said it's azimuth and elevation and it goes, it turns into some other parameters, it means that the mapping from the true times to these t values is not, is not known. So essentially, we don't know what times the points were captured. So each point is captured at an unknown time. It's got a 2D value. And I do know this model, and my model is curve of t conditioned on sliders. And I have six sliders here, theta 1 to theta 6. If you're thinking about it, you'll think an ellipse probably has five sliders, center, two axes, and an orientation. It's more convenient to do six here. It doesn't really hurt. Um, um, so, you know, 
it's fine to do six. So I've got six sliders that I want to find, and I've got all these pesky unknown t values, but I know the formula for the ellipse. Right, so now I'm copying all that information over here so you can still see it. Um, let's skip that. Um, so I wrote this again. We have a description. We are going to define closest point. We're going to talk about closest point, and I've written it down here again, min over t of distance of sample to the curve. So this is all the stuff I wrote in code earlier. Um, and what I want to do is find the shape parameters, the sliders, that minimize the sum of the distances from each of the samples to the unknown points. Look for n equals 1 to number of points, add up the sum of the distances. So this is now MATLAB code that runs, pass it into fmin unc, which is a higher order function that takes functions in. Um, so that was the equation for a curve. Here was the, uh, look at this closest point function. I just do a for loop stepping by 0 0.01 radians, right, and accumulate the minimum. Pretty dumb closest point function, but you know it's probably going to work. Okay. Then my objective function is add up calls to D. So D is closest point, it's over here. D calls C, which is up here. And shove them into FMN up. And at this point, typically after typing in all this code, you will be thinking, you're going, actually, yeah, after typing in, how many lines of code is that? 10? Um, you will be thinking, well-earned coffee break coming up. You will hit enter, and immediately it will come back. This is kind of like a 100 millisecond problem in MATLAB today. Most people don't even type in the code because they think, I'm going to hit enter and it's going to take all weekend. Right? So uh, another key message is these sort of anonymous black box functions are much faster than you think. So you can use them to do all sorts of stuff. Uh, you do that, hooray. You've predicted the ellipse. So that was really good. And then here's the thing. We just solved the problem using no mathematics, no cleverness, no nothing. We didn't uh, do anything clever. Um, the solution is fine. Perfectly accurate, and the only thing that's wrong with it is that it's slow. I wrote a you know really expensive inner loop. I passed it into an anonymous thing. I didn't compute any derivatives, so I had to do six times as much work to compute the derivatives. But really, the only thing that's wrong with the algorithm is not that it's mathematically inelegant. It's not that it's you know hacky. It's just that it's slow. And um, now, what do people do? People think, right, I'm going to make it faster, and they come up with all sorts of little strategies to make it faster. Um, the strategy that they most often come up with results in the algorithm on the left. The strategy that I would recommend results in the algorithm on the right. I will repeat those. Uh, this is wall clock time of these things converging. This one on the right is slowed down 10x. So the strategy that most people come up with is unbelievably slow. Right? And what is that strategy? I'll show you. Oh, sorry, it's this way. This is the strategy to speed it up. It's a strategy to solve it. Oh. I guess they think they're speeding it up, right? Sorry, I'm, I'm not at it yet. Um, you about the implementation of f min unc? Yes, though people, people go back to their original problem, which is at the top. Minimize, find thetas to minimize the sum of the mins over the t's. Okay, so they go back to the original problem. They say, I'm not going to optimize the inner loop, right? That's micro-optimization. I'm going to back and have a think about what I need to do. So what they observe, they observe some things. They observe that um, the thetas over here appear linearly. So my function has this form of a, a, a big matrix A times a vector of unknowns. And that means that if I only knew the times, the t's, I would get this in one shot, one linear solve of a tiny system. I would easily. So if I knew the t's, I would easily solve this chicken and egg. I end up with a chicken and egg problem, right? If I knew the t's, I could easily get out the thetas. And given the thetas, that means given the given ellipse, it turns out there's a fourth order polynomial you can derive that will give you each of the t's. So both of those solutions you get in closed form, no searching, no nothing, just you know, absolute closed form solution to each of the two steps. Solve for the thetas, solve for the t's. Right? And that is the algorithm that ran unbelievably slowly. Right? And why is it running slowly? It's running slowly because the guy on the right um, LSQ nonlin, um, is able to simultaneously vary the t's and the thetas. The guy on the left, I've got the current theta. Well, guess what? Everybody's pretty close to their closest point already. So their t's aren't going to change very much. So they don't change very much. And then the thetas don't change very much. And then the t's don't change very much. And it just gets worse and worse and worse and worse. And you can see how much worse and worse and worse and worse it gets. 
um, by doing a convergence plot. Right? So this plot is saying uh, the error on the left is what is the distance of my samples. Right? So that's, that should reduce. Low is good for that. Note the x-axis right, is log time. Right? So, you know, uh, whatever, you know, milliseconds, um, seconds, days, weeks, millennia. Okay? Because this is a super easy problem if you're solving a hard problem. These, this is literally, you know, weeks, years, decades. Um, so what happened? The, uh, the algorithm that one would think of starts off okay, right? This is kind of linear convergence, first order convergence. Still not ideal. You would want to be doubling your number of significant figures rather than adding one each time. Starts off doing that, and then around here it just gets unbelievably slow. How slow? The difference, so the typical way you stop these algorithms is you look at the current iteration and you say my function value is you know, 10 to the minus 1.32 or whatever, and then you compare it to the next step. So at this point, the point where, my, where the cursor is, the difference between successive iterates is 10 to the minus 13. Right? So you think this is definitely converged. Right? 10 to the minus 13, every step I take, nothing happens. At this point, I started just doubling. I started plotting dots only when the iteration count doubles. That's why this um, changes. So around here, the difference between successive function values is 10 to the minus 16. So it's within machine precision. You compute two successive function values. They are exactly the same. Right? And yet, you should continue on. Why should you continue on? Well, you can see that this curve is still dropping. Right? So here, function values tend, machine precision apart, still function value is dropping. What does that mean? That means the thetas, the shape parameters, and the t's are still changing. But the, func but the function, you can't even see it in the function value. Now you say, but we are sensible people. And many people tell us that you don't need to worry about these little tiny differences in function value. This is nonsense. Right? There's, you know, it's, you're, you're really trying to optimize the hell out of it. What is the test data? So in a machine learning sense, uh, the, ellipse, the dots on the ellipse are my training data. And then the test problem is going to be predict um, my Gauss point, predict where, where this comes out. So what I've plotted here on the same graph is the value of the error, right? the value of the test error, i.e. Right? how close is your prediction. So look, 10 to the minus 12, normal stopping point, we're miles away. Low is good. Carry on down here. Test error is only just really beginning to improve when we get out here to the point where the function value hasn't changed. You know, you can't even see changes in the function value. As always happens, the test error, um, there's actually, if you could magically stop early, you could report a better test error down here. But you must always just report the value you get at convergence, uh, which is some value. And it's the same as the first, second order algorithm did in, in no time. So. That's the key message. When you find yourself doing this alternation, chicken and egg, parameter one, parameter two, block one, block two, expectation maximization, whatever it is, you should ask yourself, am I solving the kind of problem which is trying to extrapolate, right? This is a hard problem, okay? It's like all my data is over here, and my job is to predict some value way out over here. Right? It feels a bit mean, but this is exactly the problem we get if we have uh, a 3D face in front of Connect and we want to predict the back of the head. Right? We need strong priors and we need good op um, optimizers to take a small amount of data from somewhere near like the front of the object and get a good answer out the back of the object. If your job is a sort of machine learning job where you're just going to delete 10% of these data and then re-predict them, no, none of these algorithms, they're all going to be exactly the same. Just pick the one that's easiest to code. Right? But if your job is to do an extrapolation, you may need to care about whether or not the thing converges. OK, so um, I said I would show you dolphins. I've already told you what a surface is, um, but I'm going to jump past some stuff to the tool that we use to describe 3D surfaces. And I'll just give you a very quick picture of what this is, because again, it looks like more like a computer program than a piece of mathematics. And yet, um, we have the tools now to treat it as mathematics. I would like to describe a smooth 3D surface. Why do I want to describe smooth 3D surfaces? One good reason is I've been doing all this optimization with derivatives, and I want the derivatives to be smooth across the surface so that my optimizations work. With my 2D splines, I was moving around some control vertices, some 2D control points, and that generated me a smooth red curve. How do I do the same in 3D? And you can do something like splines in 3D, and it's kind of messy, and there's lots of bookkeeping. Um, here's a tool called subdivision surfaces, which are super easy. They are, devised, they are defined by a recursive rule. 
And the recursive rule is take a mesh, a polygon mesh, which is not smooth, take every vertex in the mesh, take every triangle in the mesh, oh, sorry, and that will define this blue surface by take every triangle in the mesh. Now, replace every triangle, so every triangle would get split into four like this, and replace every new vertex by a sort of weighted average of its neighbors. So you can imagine the vertices will all move in a little bit. Repeat. And if you recurse that infinitely, the uh, finite number of triangles you started with will turn into an infinite number of triangles describing the blue curve. And it turns out that we can do various things with this blue curve um, that allow us to fit um, dolphins to data. And now I'm going to uh, come out of here and find some dolphins um, and let you go. So what I'm going to do there we go, is um, I'm going to start off some dolphins. This is the same one rigid fixed dolphin template. Uh, overlay it on the images. And hit play. And what we're going to do is we're going to watch this uh, nonlinear optimizer. Instead of fitting an ellipse in very small amount of time, it's fitting 500, 1,500, if you can remember, Tom, tell me, some large number of parameters for dolphins. It's simultaneously discovering the sliders as well as the fit of the dolphins to the image. You see these dolphins don't fit very well uh, for two reasons. Number one, their position isn't very good, and also they're not bent into the right shape. So we discover everything in one giant optimization. Um, if I hit play. And again, you might worry about local minima. Well, you know, if you look at this dolphin who's just eaten a very large cornflake, um, that's the kind of thing that looks to, uh, to the uninitiated like a nasty local optimum. But um, the, because the nonlinear optimizer is working in very high dimensions, this is a hand-waving explanation, but because it's working in very high dimensions, things are very easy, um, and uh, it, it figures it out. Now, there is, there's a load of other stuff going on here. Um, every time it pauses, it stopped doing this. Um, you might be thinking, how would I solve this problem of closest point on a spline surface if there were lots of local optima? And one thing you could do is a for loop over the control vertices, followed by the nonlinear optimization inside. Well, something like that is happening um, every time it pauses. <coughs> so it would have fallen into a local optimum if we hadn't done that. Um, but equally, if we didn't do the continuous optimization, we wouldn't be able to get to the answer. OK. Um, I will leave that there. Um, thank you. unsettling lack of mention of priors and, oh. <laughs> and other things which are about which I have scary dreams. Why are um, these not being present? You're absolutely right. There are, uh, there are loads of priors. Um, I just didn't bother telling you about them. <laughs> um, um, so there's a prior that the uh, coefficients, the alphas, uh, so second last row from the bottom, are small. Um, there's a prior that the points on the contour, so we're using silhouettes for this, and silhouettes are a nightmare to deal with, because um, I'm a 3D object, right? And you're getting my silhouette view, so if I trace the part of me that is giving rise to the silhouette, it comes up the leg here, and then suddenly it bounces onto the hand, and then it's back onto the chest, and the nose. So that's a nightmare to deal with. So um, there's a little prior down here that says, keep these guys close to each other unless you can't, um, and a bunch of other stuff. There's a prior smooth basis that says, uh, don't make the dolphin too wobbly. Uh, that too. So my point is, um, not look. This looks like one of those slides, which is look. I did a load of complicated maths, right? It really isn't. Anyone who reads through this knows what's going on. Nothing here is complicated, right? It's, you know, it's all exactly computer graphics. Right? So I've just written down a load of computer graphics. Um, and said, throw it into this optimizer, it'll be fine. And of course, it, that's not strictly true, but that's the first order message to get. So, uh, there was one the first. Then, yeah. um, so, in 1800, who finally found the. Oh, sorry, it was Gauss. <laughs> no one knows. <laughs> um, um, uh, much later, when the method of least squares was independently invented, Gauss says, ah, oh, I did that, I did that. How else could I have made the prediction of Sarah's? <laughs> <laughs> um, 
Uh, I don't know, somehow my guess, and I haven't done loads of reading on this, but I've done a bit. I think he uh, took random triplets or quadruplets of points on the ellipse, fitted to them, made a prediction from each of them, and then averaged all the predictions. Right? I, my guess is that he did. Is that called bagging? What's that called? Someone who knows things. Uh, I, did, I think he did a kind of a slightly Bayesian thing. Um, they both give an equivalently good answer uh, in the tests I've done. One is for, for the noisy data he showed with the ellipses. Do you do you have a, an idea of what are good noise models? Do you just ah ah um uh you know for the for the stuff that's just noise noise that's fine. Write down what you like. You know Gaussian whatever. Right. What really matters is the stuff that isn't just noise noise, i.e. big outliers. Right. So that's you know essentially those are the two things you need to worry about. Um, uh, and I, everything I showed had sort of squared things in it, which implies we don't have big outliers. If you want to minimize a function with big outliers in it, um, so, oops. What's uh, big outlier? I'll show you in a second. Tell me it's a giraffe or a dolphin. Uh, no, it's like this. So um, here's the silhouette, nicely drawn here. Can you see my mouse? No, you can't. Um, so there's the silhouette going down there. And imagine I've got a point out here. So there's another dolphin nearby. And... Um, I've got points from the other dolphin as well, and I don't know which are which. Right? So if I try to smoothly match to the true silhouette points and the guys over on the left, everything's going to go horribly wrong. Right? It's going to, I've only got four such points. I've got hundreds of these guys, but nevertheless, it's going to kind of drag my shape out here. It's going to be horrible. And that's because I'm paying x squared, right? So because the shape is not... Um, because the shape is not hugging, the shape is paying x squared for these guys, x squared for these guys is going to be dragged out. So what you do is you don't pay x squared, you pay a different function. So x squared, as I plot it, looks like that. And the further away you are, the more you pay. Well, what you do is you make the function flatten out like this. It should go flat, not down again. Right? And that's called a robust kernel. So now what happens is you're paying your x squared unless it's just all got too much, right? And then you pay this sort of constant penalty. And that has the good property that, um, uh, you know, because there are lots more uh, true silhouette points there on the inside, uh, it'll basically make these guys just pay the flat cost. Until recently, that was a nightmare for optimization. Simple test that it's a nightmare for optimization is if everybody starts in this flat region, all the derivatives are zero. So you're not going to go anywhere, right? So that's not good. Um, um, I say until recently. Um, so recently, um, one of our um, former postdocs um, had a paper. It's sort of the end of a sequence of papers um, where this is just nailed in a good way. And I'd love to tell you about it but some other time. But actually, if you do ever have a robust fitting problem, um, do come to me. Are we allowed to know his name? Uh, Christopher Zach. Yeah. Uh, it's mentioned, it's a funny thing with the history. It's mentioned in a paper in 91 by Michael Black and not quite done. And then we mentioned it in a paper in 14, not quite done. And, you know, it, um, but now it's nailed. Uh, so you you're working with students. Uh, so you're excluding shading completely? Yes. Could that, could that help? Uh, that yes, help? probably, because, you know, the rules should be throwing everything. Um, shading's really hard. Sorry? What was the question? Uh, can you use shading? Can you use the fact that the dolphin is moving from you know, bright to dark as a function of where the light is on him? And you know, the solution is, well, you throw in extra unknowns for the lights. And then you, and, you know, if I believe myself saying a million and five unknowns is better than five, I should just do it. But uh, I don't know. We, I guess, yeah. <laughs> seemed hard. Totally. Oh, vertical bars in front of the picture. Indeed. Your method would work well. It would work fine, providing, let's say, there wasn't the same part of the dolphin, which is an important sticky out part, uh, so included in every single view. So if every single view conspired to uh, remove this fin, Then, then we, we would just fill it in with smooth stuff. If you saw right. the fins, you might be able to guess the smooth part well. 
uh, you should be able to get any smooth part. Yeah. Um, and uh, also, if we think about it, <coughs> in some sense, lots of the object is occluded. I mean, in 3D, sort of half the object is facing the other way. Um, uh, I mean, it sounds trivial, but you know, uh, you can't see every data point on the object. So, yeah, it, it deals pretty well. Okay, if there are no further questions, then uh, I'm going to retire to drinks and nibbles. Thank you. Thank you.